We have some new faces with us today, starting at my far right, Sarah Feinberg, who runs the New York City Transit System. To her left, Patrick Foy, chairman of the MTA. Dr. Howard Zucker, you know, commissioner of the New York State Department of Health. To my left, Melissa DeRosa, secretary to the governor. To her left, Robert Mujica, who is the budget director of the state of New York and is wears a second hat today because he's also a member of the MTA board. Doesn't really wear a second hat, that was metaphorical. What day is today? The, when I was at uh, Housing and Urban Development, uh, I would sometimes say in a staff meeting, what day is today? What's the date? And I worked with a great fellow who was a Catholic priest, Father Joseph Hakala. And he would say, today is another day to do better. This warm smile. Today is another day to do better. Uh, he passed away, Father Hakala. I have his picture in my, uh, in my room, and I was thinking about him last night. Today is another day to do better. It's another day to improve. It's another day to be better, to make life better, to be better at helping people. Today's another day, another opportunity God gave us. Hospitalizations are down. Good news. Net change in total hospitalizations down. Good news. Net change in intubations down. Good news. New COVID cases slightly down, 933, but still unacceptable, but down from where it was. Number of lives lost, still terrible, 306. Uh, optimists would say the numbers on the decline. Realists would say that's a tremendous amount of pain and grief for hundreds and hundreds of New Yorkers who lost a loved one. Big question everybody one is asking, reopening, when, how, where? said from day one on this situation, we have to be smart. We're at a place we've never been before. Emotions run high. Be smart, follow numbers, follow data, talk to experts. Don't get political. Even in this election year, even at this partisan time in this country where everything is political and everything is polarized, not now. And respond to facts and data and experts, not to emotion, which also runs very high right now. If we do this right, it is a science reopening. Uh, it's not a political exercise. It is a science. It can be based on numbers and data. And that is true. Everybody wants to reopen. Caveat is, reopen, but don't reopen in a way that increases the spread of the virus, doesn't increase the rate of the spread of the virus. Well, how do you know that? You can test. You can get numbers, test, get a sample, and see what's happening. You know that if the rate of transmission goes over 1.1, you are in an outbreak, you're in an epidemic. So you don't have to guess. It's not what it feels like. Get the numbers, do the testing, get the numbers, rely on the numbers. The second fact you have to deal with as a science in this formula, do you have the hospital capacity available if that rate of infection increases? Don't go above 70% capacity. So you have a 30% buffer, so we don't wind up in the same mad scramble that we were in last time. Make sure you have ICU beds with the 30% capacity, and make sure you have enough equipment. We're not going to go through who has a mask, who has a gown, who knows someone in China. Uh, let's have at least a 30-day supply of uh, stockpiled equipment, ventilators, masks, gowns, gloves, etc. They are facts, it's science, it's data. Uh, then, What's testing? Testing, then you trace, then you isolate, and that remains the, the key to controlling the rate of infection. 
The testing is how you monitor the rate of infection. What's happening to the rate as you increase the, uh, the economy, the economic activity? I will take a test and we'll test enough people so we have enough data to make a decision. We're increasing the number of tests. It's hard. Nobody's done it on this scale before. There's been a lot of back and forth. Met with the federal government, met with the president. We have now a partnership in how to do testing. We're ramping up testing. We're moving very quickly in this state. We do more tests in this state than in any other state in the United States. We do more testing in this state than any country on the globe per capita. So we're doing it well. We're doing it aggressively. We've increased from about 20,000 tests to about 30,000 tests per day. And we're still ramping up, and that's good. Uh, more to do on testing and more to talk about on testing, but not today. Today we're going to talk about tracing, which is the second step after testing, right? You test, you now know what's happening on the infection rate. You can gauge your decisions based on that infection rate. Second step is trace those people who came up positive, all right? You test it, you have the data. You can adjust the opening valve, reopening valve. Now you trace. When you get a positive, you talk to that person and trace back who they have been in contact with. You then test those people. You then isolate those people so you don't increase the rate of infection. Uh, that's what tracing is. The faster you trace, the better. You want to test right away. You think you have symptoms. You think you were exposed. Come and get a test. Do it today. Once you get that test results, you have data on what's happening with the infection spread. You then right away, as quickly as you can, uh, trace that person who have they met with, who have they been in close contact with over the past 14 days, and you then contact those people and say, you may have been uh, in contact with Dan, Dan tested positive, uh, you should check your symptoms. If you develop any symptoms, let me know right away, and uh, we'll bring you in to take a test. That is Tracy. The problem is, it's not rocket science to do it on an individual basis. The problem is the scale that we have to do this at. Yesterday, we tested 4,681 people who were positive. Yesterday, 4,681 people were positive. How do you now? communicate with 4,681 people, trace back all the people they've been in contact with over the past 14 days, close contact, and contact those people. That is an overwhelming scale to an operation that has never existed before. We do tracing now, but on a very limited basis. That's why this is so hard, tracing. In and of itself, one person, it's easy. 4,681 on one day. Today, we'll have another 4,681 people. So just think of the scale of the operation. Last week, we announced that Michael Bloomberg would lead the first ever testing, tracing, isolation program. Figure out how many people, how to train them, what technology, how do we do this? Uh, and it's of a scale never been done before. And by the way, we need it tomorrow. There is no time to go get a university to do a study and a, a blueprint and then uh, put a plan together. We need it tomorrow because we're literally doing it right now. We're doing the testing. We're coming up to scale on the testing. You need the tracing to come up to scale to meet what we're doing on testing. The estimate so far is you need 30 contact tracers for every 100,000 people who 
are in the affected area. Statewide, that would be about 6,400 to 17,000 tracers, depending on what happens on the testing rate. The more people test positive, the more tracers. The less people test positive, the less tracers you need. So these things are all linked, right? The better you do at reducing the spread of the virus, the fewer people test positive, and the fewer, fewer people you need to trace back. But it will require, under any estimate, a tracing army to come up to scale very, very quickly. Uh, and Mayor Bloomberg has put together a great team who's going to work on this. He has great talent in his uh, Bloomberg philanthropy. Johns Hopkins University working together with the New York State Department of Health. This is that undertaking, and it is massive, and that's why uh, bringing in a person with the talent of Mayor Bloomberg and the experience of Mayor Bloomberg to do this is essential. Where do you get the Army? Well, we have Department of Health employees all across the state. Counties have them, cities have them, the state has them. We'll marshal those employees. You also have a lot of government employees who are at home now getting paid but are not working. What government employees who are now existing, city, state, county, can we deploy to become tracers and then train them, et cetera. After you go through all of that, if you don't have enough, you're going to have to hire people. Uh, and then you have to train them right away because nobody's done this before. They're going to need help. They're going to need technology. They're going to need monitoring. They're going to have to be tested before they can do this. So it's a massive undertaking. And that's why uh, Mayor Bloomberg's involvement and his generosity here is so Im important. And uh, we want to offer a big thank you to Mayor Mike Bloomberg, who I believe uh, may be joining us by telephone or some technological means. Yes. There he is. How are you, Mayor Mike? I'm here. Uh, good Governor, to see you. I'm fine uh, and good. Uh, it's good to see you. And I want to thank you for all your good work to lead of this great state through this crisis and to deliver facts and data to the public and also a sense of hope, which really is important. I know your daily press conferences have become must-see TV for a lot of people. And for your record, for the record, I thought your advice to fathers on what to say about a daughter's boyfriend was exactly right the other day. Anyways, the question in everybody's mind continues to be, how can we begin to loosen these restrictions and begin reopening the economy? And one of the most important steps to taking, we have to take to reopen the economy as safely as possible is to create a system of contact tracing, as you just outlined. When social distancing is relaxed, contract contact tracing is our best hope for isolating the virus when it appears and keeping it isolated. Uh, the governor has recognized that, and since Bloomberg Philanthropies has deep experience and expertise in public health, we're glad to support the state in developing and implementing a contact tracing program. As Andrew said, the contract contact tracing is a way to identify people who may have been exposed to the virus but don't know it. And doing that requires a lot of well-trained people who are coordinated and managed effectively. It is a very big undertaking just because of the scale. So we've enlisted the best public health school in the world at Johns Hopkins University. No offense, but it's named the Bloomberg School of Public Health, which our foundation works very closely with on, with on public health and other issues. And we've also teamed up with the nonprofit organizations vital strategies and resolve to save lives. Now, get the contract tracing program up and running a lot has to happen first, and hiring, training, deploying, and managing a small army of New Yorkers, as the governor said, is really the great challenge. To help the state recruit contact tracers, we've brought in a staffing organization, and we're also teamed up with CUNY and SUNY, both of which will help identify potential job applicants, and I want to thank both of them for their work in joining us. 
To help the state with training, Johns Hopkins has developed a training class which can be taken remotely. It will cover all the basic information of epidemics, contact tracing, and privacy. There's also a test at the end of the training, which you have to pass in order to be hired. So we're not going to put up people there that don't know what they're doing. We'll also put technology to use in other ways. Vital Strategies is developing three new smartphone apps. The first will help contact tracers find information and data quickly. The second will help the public provide information to health departments. And the third will allow those in quarantine to access the guidance and services they need, including the ability to report any symptoms they may be experiencing. Vital Strategies is also working directly with the state to develop protocols and workflow materials for contract tracers and managers. That includes a comprehensive playbook that will detail the steps needed to do contact tracing effectively. And I want to make it clear, we will release that playbook publicly so cities and states around the country can use it, and so can nations around the world. That way, the work we do here in New York really can help fight the virus globally. We'll also bring in a group of outside experts to conduct an evaluation of the program so that other states and countries can see what worked well and identify areas they can improve on. And we'll learn as we go and make adjustments and share what we've learned. Sharing and spreading best practices is something that Bloomberg Philanthropies works on with cities around the world. In about an hour, I'll be getting on a call with mayors around the country, which is a call we hold every week. It's been a good way to share information and strategies and I know all of the mayors are following the news of the contract tracing program that we are starting here and that other states have also begun the process of starting. Now, my far, I, before I turn it back over to the governor, let me just echo something that he has said repeatedly and that really is important to remember. As tough as these times are, we are New Yorkers and we've been through a lot together and we're going to get through this together again. So, Governor, back to you, and thank you for everything you're doing. Together, we're going to lick this and get back to a normal life that we can, and we are so proud of the way the citizens of this state are behaving. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, Mayor Bloomberg. This is uh, such a great asset for the state of New York and all the people in it. Uh, this is a monumental undertaking. You know, so many of these things that we talk about just never existed before. Testing of this magnitude, contact, tracing uh, of this magnitude, it's never existed. So we have to design new systems, new approaches uh, to do this. And this problem is bigger than any one of us, but it is not bigger than all of us. And uh, using the expertise and the talent that we have, we get everyone to work together here. Uh, we will do this. And the mayor is exactly right. New York, uh, New York, he says as a New Yorker, in many cases, we've dealt with challenges first. We figure it out. And then we work with other places to actually learn from what we've done. I think this is going to be one of those examples. We want the best system that we can have to get New York open and to pre protect New Yorkers. But it will also be a laboratory to put together the best system ever put together so we can share that with other governments. And that's what uh, Mayor Bloomberg does so well. Uh, he did as mayor, and he does it uh, now uh, through his philanthropy. So. We'll develop the best system here, and then what we learn, we hope, can benefit other people. We'll also be coordinating this contact tracing on a tri-state basis, uh, because many of the people who come into New York, live in Connecticut, live in New Jersey, go back and forth. Uh, we don't want to get limited by jurisdictions when you're doing this contact tracing. Somebody turns, turns out uh, you have a trace that takes you to a person in New Jersey, well, we work in New York, we can't go to New Jersey. Having that tri-state alliance makes uh, tremendous sense. Uh, so I'm working with Governor Murphy and Governor Lamont on that, and I wanna thank them very much. 
Next problem. Stone to stone across the morass, right? Problem to problem across the morass. In this situation, every day, there's a new problem that pops up. Okay, let's, let's handle it. Next problem. In an emergency crisis situation, what happens is problems compound, right? Uh, you're in the middle of a hurricane. The power lines go down. Now the power lines go down. Now the heat is off. Heat is off. Now people are freezing in their homes. We didn't anticipate that. I know, but that's what happens. One problem creates another problem. It's like a bad game of dominoes. And these problems compound each other. And the combination is often unforeseen. We have that now with the New York City subway system. Uh, Daily News did a front page story which crystallized it, but it had been happening for weeks and no one anticipated it, but you have a virus outbreak uh, and this conditions on the New York City subway system for a variety of reasons have rapidly deteriorated. When you think about what happened, you can put it together in the retrospective. The COVID outbreak happens. New York City is a place of density. Subways, buses are a place of density. MTA employees who run that system, care for that system, get sick, call in sick, as they should. They don't want to infect other people. The number of MTA employees comes down. Number of NYPD, New York Police Department. They get sick, their numbers come down. You now have fewer MTA workers, you have fewer uh, NYPD workers on the trains and in the stations. Uh, we have now a greater need than ever to disinfect the subways, the buses, and the stations. Why? Because you're in the middle of a pandemic, this is a place of density, and you have uh, thousands and thousands of people going through these subway stations, these turnstiles, and these buses, uh, trains, and ADA vehicles. Because MTA workers are sick, NYPD uh, officers are sick, you have fewer people to monitor and maintain the system. And this all happens in the midst of a public health emergency. Uh, at the same time, you have more homeless people who now are on fewer trains, and you have fewer people to outreach to the homeless people. So now you, you put all of this together. And then, at the same time, we need our essential workers to go to work. I said the other day, I had two great nightmares from day one. Nightmare one, you did everything you did, closed down, et cetera, and you didn't stop the rate of increase of the virus. That would have been a nightmare. Can you imagine if we did all of this and we still saw that virus going up? That would have been a real problem. Second nightmare, the essential workers say, I'm not going to work. I'm not going. The transit operators, the police, the food delivery people say, it's too dangerous. I'm not going. I'm staying home too. You don't have food. You don't have power. You don't have transportation. You don't have electric. Now you see society in a really difficult situation. So we need those essential workers to go to work. I am pushing every day to get our essential workers to go to work, even though they see a lot of their colleagues getting ill. You need those nurses, you need those doctors uh, in very difficult circumstances. That's why I say they are the heroes of today, all the essential workers. How do our essential workers get to work? They need the public transit system. It's true in New York City, it's true all across the state. 
They need the buses, they need the trains, they need the subways to get to work. We need them, they need the buses, and they need the subways. And we are as a society, me as a spokesperson for the state, I'm saying to them every day, I need you to do this. I know it's hard, but I need you to do it. Okay, we need them to do it, but what is our obligation? Our obligation is to make sure we're doing everything we can do to keep them safe, right? That's my personal obligation, and it's the collective obligation. You want them to be there to deliver the food, What's your obligation is to do everything you're doing, you can do to make sure that they are safe while they're doing it. The MTA understood where we were with this global pandemic. They stepped up operations and were cleaning trains and buses every 72 hours, which is an amazing undertaking when you think about it, uh, to clean all those buses and trains every 72 hours. But we know the virus can live for hours or even days on a surface, which means if somebody positive walks onto a train this morning, that virus can be there tomorrow and the next day. That then changes the whole focus of the problem. You want to honor the essential workers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll fly airplanes, we'll have uh, uh, public demonstrations of gratitude. Yeah, even better than that is what you do and how you act. And let's make sure that we're doing everything we can. Let's clean, disinfect those trucks, those buses and trains every 24 hours. Why? Because that's the way we best protect the health of our essential workers, which makes sense if you want the essential workers to continue to come to work, it makes sense if you don't want the infection rate to go up in your society. It makes sense if you don't want the essential workers to get sick. And again, it is our obligation as human beings uh, to reciprocate and make sure we're doing everything we can. Now to say disinfect every train every 24 hours is uh, just a task that nobody has ever imagined before, okay? I would wager in the history of public transportation in this nation, you never had a challenge of disinfecting every train every 24 hours. Disinfect, how do you even disinfect a train? You know, we clean trains. But how do you disinfect? This is a whole new process. These are new chemicals. These are, this is new equipment for workers. It's new methods. Just think about it. You have to disinfect every place that a hand could touch on a subway car. Every rail, every pole, every door, wherever a hand could touch or coughing, sneezing, wherever droplets could land, right? So you have to disinfect that entire uh, interior of the car. And then you have to disinfect the stations, the handrails, everything that people could be touching. It is a massive undertaking that we've never done before. But that is the right thing to do. That is, as we said, we've never done tracing before. We've never done disinfecting train cars before, but so what? That's what we have to do. So figure out how to do what you have to do. And this is what we have to do. And I challenge the MTA to come up with a plan. They came up with a plan. They can disinfect all trains and buses every night. It can best be done by stopping train service from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. every night during the pandemic so they can actually perform this service. Now, remember the context that we're in in this pandemic. Ridership is down 92%. One to five are the slow hours, 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, it's the lowest ridership. Uh, estimate is about 10,000 people run the system, uh, ride the system overall during that period of time. So the MTA 
will launch what they call the Essential Connector Program. They'll have buses, dollar vans, and if necessary, will provide four higher vehicles to transport a person, uh, the Uber, the Lyft, the via, via vehicles, at uh, no cost to the essential worker during those hours to provide transport. Uh, so people who need transportation during 1 a.m. And, and 5 a.m. can have it, will have it, even to the extent of a four higher vehicle paid for by the MTA. Remember, 1 a.m. to 5 a.m., uh, we don't have bars open, we don't have restaurants open, so you don't have a lot of uh, traffic that you would normally have. You do have essential workers who are using our trains and subways, and they will have transportation during that period of time. This is going to be one of the most uh, aggressive, creative, uh, challenging undertakings that the MTA has done. It's going to require the MTA, the state, the city, the NYPD to all work together. It's not that easy to stop train service. You have to close down stations. You have to make sure people don't walk in. Then you have to figure out how to clean all these trains and all these stations. Uh, I've consulted with the elected officials on the MTA's recommendation, and we all agree to accept the plan on the Essential Connector Program. The MTA is undertaking something that people would have said was virtually impossible. Uh, trains and buses will be disinfected daily. Service will continue. The MTA will also disinfect the fleet on the MT, uh, the Metro North and the Long Island Railroad, which is what goes out to Long Island, goes to the northern suburbs. Uh, they can do that uh, without any disruption in service because of the volume of ridership, et cetera. So just think about it. The entire public transit system in downstate New York will be disinfected uh, every 24 hours. This is uh, a joint MTA state city partnership. We are doing a lot of things here that we've never done before. And I am never one to shy away from a challenge. I don't believe government has that option. I'm never one to say, well, that's just too much, too hard, too ambitious. We can do it. I believe we can do it. I believe we can do anything. I believe we can build bridges. I believe we can build airports. I believe we can defeat global pandemics. But uh, this is as ambitious as anything that we've ever undertaken. Uh, and it's going to require a lot of extraordinary service and effort from multiple agencies all working together. The MTA has stepped up by recommending this plan. Uh, the state will do whatever it has to do. A uh, big part of this falls to the city, and I've spoken to Mayor de Blasio. It's going to require a lot of assistance from the NYPD. It's going to require a lot of assistance from different city agencies. Uh, again, close down every station, close down the trains. Uh, we've never been here before. And I guarantee another 10 things come up when we go to do this that are also unanticipated consequences. Uh, so the mayor is really stepping up to the plate here and uh, is doing something that no mayor has ever attempted to do before. Uh, we'll all do our part, we'll all work together, but it's a heck of an undertaking uh, for the mayor. And I applaud him for uh, his ambition here in stepping up and taking this on. You know, it's always easier to just say no. It's always easier to say we can't do it. Because when you say we will try to do it, now you're changing things. And whenever you change, there's opposition <laughs> every time. Uh, so it's always easier just to stay status quo. 
uh, it's always easier not to risk to be, uh, not to try to raise the bar because maybe you can't do it, maybe there will be problems. So it's easier just to say no. It's easier to say uh, this is all we can do, it's impossible. That's not what the mayor is doing here. The mayor is stepping up and he's stepping up in a big way. Uh, and I want to applaud him for it. And I think we have the mayor who is on the telephone or some electronic means. There he is. Mayor Bill de Blasio. Welcome to Albany. Thanks, Governor. It's a pleasure to be with you. Governor, um, I want to end that last point you made about all of us together. Uh, doing something different, doing something necessary, uh, and being willing together to go someplace we've never been before. You and I have talked about this kind of idea a lot over the years. You know, I think when we first met each other, the word disruption was considered a bad thing. Uh, in recent years, it's taken on a very positive connotation that when we disrupt something that isn't working or has been thought about in a very narrow way and we go someplace new and better, that's a positive. And I think what we're talking about today is exactly that. And I commend you uh, and everyone at the MTA. And I want to talk about why I think this plan is so important in terms of our essential workers, our first responders, our healthcare heroes, why I think it's so important in terms of also addressing homelessness in a new and powerful way. But I first want to say, uh, I want to express my appreciation along with you, really appreciate back on one of your previous topics, the contact tracing, really appreciate that uh, my predecessor, Michael Bloomberg, is stepping up in such a big way for New York City and New York State. Uh, and contact tracing, the test and trace approach is going to change everything. You and I are united in that as well, the aggressive approach. In fact, Governor, New York City right now is hiring a thousand contact tracers with healthcare background to supercharge this effort. And I think we are going to be able to show this country a model that's going to be extraordinarily effective in beating back this disease. So I look forward to that partnership as well. But right here on the issue of the MTA, uh, we've all been throwing the biggest curveball in our lives with this pandemic, but look at the consistent heroism of the healthcare workers, the first responders, the grocery store workers, the pharmacists, everyone who came forward. And Governor, I know you feel it too. Uh, it's probably the proudest moment we've had as public servants in this state, in this city, watching the heroism of these New Yorkers who have stepped up. Now, we owe it to them to understand their lives. And the notion that they have a daily routine where they go into battle, they go toward the danger, they go where the infection is, uh, which so many people couldn't even imagine, but that's what these heroes are doing. We owe it to them to support them every way possible. You and I have talked many times about the PPEs and the basic protections, but we also owe it to them to be safe on the way to work on the way back home to their families. So I think what we're doing here in partnership is exactly the right thing to say, we're going to find a way to make our subway system cleaner than it's probably ever been in its history, honestly, and address this crisis in a whole new way. I agree with that and I commend you for it. And yeah, it took some disruption to say, we're gonna do something during this pandemic we've never done before, but it makes sense when it comes to protecting our heroes. The second point, homelessness. Look, another issue you and I governed on decades. Well, we know it's been in many ways an intractable issue because there wasn't always an impulse to disrupt. And here is an example of saying, look, we now have found new ways to get street homeless people off the street. And I want to commend uh, Commissioner Dermot Shea and everyone at the NYPD who's really focused on how to help the homeless, Commissioner Steve Banks, everyone at Homeless Services and Social Services, and all those, also those heroic outreach workers. Uh, Governor, you know about this work, who go out there day after day to engage homeless people on the streets and the subway, get their trust and get them to come in to shelter and ultimately to permanent housing. This work has always been in some ways stymied by the reality of a homeless person who is struggling with everything they're dealing with, a mental health challenge, a substance abuse challenge, 
riding the subway all night long. We're New Yorkers. We know about this reality. And it's been put in a stark light by this crisis, like so many other challenges and disparities have. Well, it's an unacceptable reality. And this new plan will disrupt that unacceptable reality and allow us to actually get help to people more effectively. Because if you're not going back and forth all night on a train, then you actually are coming above ground where outreach workers are there to help you, where NYPD officers trained in homeless outreach are there to support homeless people and get them to a better situation. A governor, you know, for decades in this city, somehow uh, homeless encampments were actually tolerated. People thought, oh, it's the kind of thing, what can we do about that? I'm proud to say in the last few years, uh, homeless services, NYPD, uh, nonprofit organizations, we got together and we said, we're not allowing that anymore. We shut them down and we found it actually helped us to get the homeless to the help they need. This is another example of that. So I wanna let you know that uh, as we all talked about this idea, and I commend you, your team in Albany, and obviously uh, the team at the MTA, Pat Foy, Sarah Feinberg, it's been a very productive conversation these last few days. And what I think we've come to together is the, yeah, we're gonna do something unprecedented. We're gonna do something because of an emergency, but we're also gonna do something that's gonna protect people and offer a new way to get people help who never got enough. And so governor, thank you. Uh, I think this is a partnership, you're right. It's not gonna be easy. No one said it was gonna be easy, but you have my full commitment, the commitment of the city, the commitment of the NYPD and all of our agencies. We're gonna make this work together. And we're going to be able to look back and say, we did something that actually changed people's lives for the better. And as long as it takes, we're going to stand with you and get this done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor de Blasio. Mayor made a lot of good points. You're right, Bill. Nobody, nobody ever said it was going to be easy. But nobody ever said it was going to be this hard either. Uh, and I think the mayor's point is very well taken. Look. We're doing things all across the board here that have never been done before. And I think there are lessons to learn and lessons we'll take with us. Telemedicine, I think, is a lesson we'll take with us. Teleeducation, remote learning is a lesson we'll take with us. Uh, a new public health system is a lesson that we'll take with us. Uh, and I think we're going to improve and learn from this experience with the New York City transit system. Because the truth is, it wasn't working well. Uh, or as well as it should before. Uh, we did have a problem with the homeless. And uh, Bill is right, Mayor uh, de Blasio is right. Um, I've worked on it all my life. Uh, outreaching to homeless people is very, very hard. And getting them to come in to a place that actually provides services is very, very hard. Uh, so this can actually energize uh, the connections with outreach workers in the homeless population. And we've, uh, we've never had to disinfect uh, trains like this or buses like this, and they will be cleaner than ever before. So uh, global pandemic, but you live, you learn, you move on, and most importantly, you meet the challenge. You meet the challenge. And this is a daunting challenge. Uh, and the mayor is stepping into it with eyes wide open, and it takes guts and it takes courage, and there'll be bumps along the way, I guarantee you, but uh, that's where we are, and that's why we get the big bucks. Uh, but I also want to be able to say today to the essential workers, we thank you, not just with words, but with our actions, and I want you to know we're doing everything we can to keep you and your family safe. And that's what it means to say thank you. Act with gratitude. Don't just use the words, act with gratitude. They're on those trains. They deserve to be kept safe. They deserve to have a clean, safe ride to and from work. Uh, and they're going to have it. Uh, and we're going to move heaven and earth to make sure that happens. So in a challenge, what do we do? We come together. And we rise to the occasion. Never did it before. I know. So we'll do it now. And we'll figure out how to do it. And we've overcome every obstacle that we've been thrown. We have the beast on the retreat. We're making ground every day. We just have to keep it up. And we will. 
because we are New York tough, we are smart, we are disciplined, we are unified, and we are loving. Questions? Governor, in, in terms of the subway shutdown,